Welcome back to Care Decoded, the show where we simplify the complex world of risk adjustment, documentation, and AI to power better care. My name is Lucy Medina, and I'll be your host today. Today's episode is especially close to home. We're diving into something every clinician has felt but rarely talks about, documentation burnout. From endless clicks to broken workflows, we'll unpack how the current system often takes more than it gives and how we can shift from burden to benefit. And for this episode, we're switching things up a little bit. I'll be interviewing you today, Sunil. And as many of of you already know, Sunil is the CEO at InfraScience, but he's also a practicing physician, so he sees the real impact of documentation challenges and breakthroughs every single day. Uh, so welcome, Sunil, and if you're ready, we'll start with the first uh, question that I have for you today. Thank you. Thank you for um, being the host today. Yeah, of course, of course. All right, so let's dive in. Um, let's start with something really honest. Do you remember a time when documentation completely derailed your clinical workflow, maybe even cost you a moment with a patient? Yeah, I mean, I'll start with an obvious extreme example. If you lose uh, power or you lose internet, right? So, I mean, that completely derails it. I mean, there have been obviously occasions for me and I'm sure for other clinicians that sometimes you have to send the patient home because we are so reliant on the EHRs, but, and, you know, obviously didn't used to be that way with the paper charts. Doesn't mean that I'm advocating we go back to paper charts, but just, you know, there's this, there's a very heavy dependency on technology, right? But uh, even if you think about other things, like I know there are certain colleagues in my area who, who use headsets to basically dictate the note as they are talking to patients. And as you can imagine, that is pretty disruptive, and I've never heard a good thing from a patient about that. So it, that's where, you know, it's really intruding right in your face. But but the majority of the time, it's not as bad. A majority of the time, what is happening is that the physician is so focused on the documentation that they are not even really talking to the patient. They are looking at the screen while the patient is talking, and uh, it's it's not not the greatest of experiences, right? I tend to type pretty good without, uh, you know, with, without actually having to look at the keyboard. So I can actually type while I'm talking to uh, patients. I haven't heard too many complaints, but yeah, generally speaking, it's the technology is too, too intrusive, I think, right, during the patient encounter. Right, right. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, you lose a little bit of the like in-person contact, face-to-face, like more personal contact if you're having to look at your computer or even speaking um, and just dictating and everything. Um, Yeah, Yeah. I mean, that definitely makes sense. So before we really get tactical, um, how would you describe the emotional tax that today's documentation systems put on physicians? Yeah, I mean, documentation, there are obviously studies that show that uh, physicians spend more time documenting than actually talking to the patient, seeing the patient, right? So that's a huge burden. And not even only during the patient encounter, because there's so much to do as far as documentation is concerned that you really cannot finish the documentation while you are with the patient, right? Because you've got other people waiting. It's a line. It's every 15 minutes or whatever, right? The cadences. So at the end of the day, you are stuck with, I don't know, whatever number of patients you saw, 15, 20, 25 charts that you have to complete. And uh, depending on how diligent the provider is, it's an easily a minimum hour, maybe two to three hours a day they're spending, right? After, after they're done with patients. So what that also means is that a lot of times they're bringing it home and they're doing it after dinner or on the weekends. Um, I mean, I have a a uh, buddy of mine who's a gynecologist and for years he could not did not want to play tennis with us on the weekend because he uh, he had to do his charts so i think eventually oh, after a few years he did catch up to to a certain extent but yeah it's just you know it affects family life it affects uh, you know your uh, interaction with your kids so yeah it's it's uh, there's, there's a big 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 burden on the physicians yeah, definitely. Not a lot of work-life balance and time to recharge, really, right? Absolutely. 
Definitely. And why do you think um, most EHRs have failed to support good documentation workflows? Do you think it's like a tech issue or more of a design fi philosophy issue? Yeah, I, I think uh, the, the root of this is that most EHRs started as an add-on to a practice management system. And really, these were built by engineers. And I don't know how much usability went into the design philosophy. Right. But uh, if, you, if you look at the way things are, I mean, you have to click multiple times when you could easily, you know, if you had designed a proper flow, then you wouldn't have to do so many clicks and things like that, right? So, and yet there are a lot of EHRs like that that are thriving in the marketplace today because, you know, there are big health systems and practices which are kind of bought into it and they have too much invested because switching to to another EHR is just, very, it's, a, it's a very tall order, right? I mean, not yeah. just financially, but just operationally, it's, it's a massive task. So uh, they, they are getting away with it. And, and in the meantime, the, the providers are bearing the brunt of it. Yeah, yeah. We hear about that a lot where um, some practices are stuck with an EHR that maybe is not helping uh, make their documentation or workflows more effective, but changing to another EHR would be so much more work, right? So exactly. definitely, yeah, definitely an issue. So let's talk impact with that. When documentation tools don't work, what really do you think gets compromised clinically, financially, and emotionally? Yeah, I mean, emotionally, we, we, we talked about that impact, right? Okay. But even clinically, you know, be, because the EHRs are, for want of a better word, pretty clunky in general, and some people are more, how should I say, proficient with it, providers I'm talking about, others are not. This is not a knock on them clinically. It's just, you know, some not everybody is that tech savvy, right? So if a provider doesn't do, can't do a good job of documenting and other clinicians are relying on it. So for example, you know, there's, uh, you send a patient to a consultant, right? And if they have not done a proper job of documenting and they're coming back to the primary care physician and they don't know what they did, so now they're in the dark. The patient already, because, oh, the doctor only spent two minutes with me or wh whatever the case is, right? They have no clue about what happened, right? And, and now I am supposed to help them with that, but I cannot because I don't have proper documentation, right? So then a lot of times, you know, yeah, obviously there's anxiety on part of the patient that there's an, that emotional burden, but, but also you end up ordering tests or things get delayed or, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, the clinical care does get affected because that documentation is not there, that communication is not there. But even financially, the documentation is supposed to support what you bill for, right? Now, if you have not done a proper job of that and there's an audit, there's a possibility that, um, you know, some payer is going to try to claw back the money. And when you're dealing with the government, it could have more than just clawing back money, right? There could be some penalties. Uh, if the medical board gets involved, now you have been in trouble with the board. So there's a lot of stuff that can happen when the, the documentation tools don't work like they're supposed to. Yeah, definitely. A, a lot of consequences. Double work. Yeah costs financially yeah not great and not just written and uh, you know suboptimal care i guess would be the word right yeah. yeah yeah patient care yeah so we know when it comes to coding many systems still rely on retrospective coding or third-party reviews we were talking about how documentation and when tools don't work this affect financially as well so when it comes to coding, what do you think is the hidden cost of delayed documentation in value-based care? Yeah, so I think the most obvious is that, say a patient saw a cardiologist, right? The patient is fairly sick and for whatever reason, and I mean, I, I know people who have these challenges, right? So they don't do a proper job of documenting, right? The patient has five, six condition. But now because they have not done a proper job of the, the conditions and the supporting data, uh, the patient looks a lot, how should I say, healthier than they actually are. So okay. at the end of the day, that those codes are not captured, even on the retrospective review, because the, the, the coder really cannot divine what the clinician was thinking or what happened, right? So at the end of the day, you you end up, for want of a better word, leaving money on the table because you did not do a proper job of capturing those, right? The flip side of it is that 
now Coda captures something based on some sort of inadequate data, right? Now mm -hmm. you are at risk that once you submit it and it goes to an audit, you don't have enough to support it, right? So either way, you can you can you can get get screwed, so to speak. You know, so uh, I think uh, yeah. So there, there's there's a lot of impact. Yeah, yeah, that definitely is not great. So let's flip this script a little bit. What do you think documentation should look like in 2025 and beyond? Yeah, I, I think there are definitely what should I say shoot shoots of hope in, in this arena, and uh, so uh, I think Lucy, you are aware of uh, Ambient Scribe. I'm sure a lot of our listeners yeah. will be aware, aware of Ambient Scribes, where the there's an application or that is listening in as the encounter is happening, and the basically using AI, the in, whole encounter gets uh, documented. I have recently started using it in my practice, and yeah, I find it quite useful that, uh, you know, it, it documents the whole thing and later on I can go edit it however I want. But at the end of the day, it does a decent job of, you know, capturing the what happened during the encounter, right? So I think that is a very nice uh, feature, which hopefully over time will help people save time, do better documentation, and still get home on time. And there are plenty of studies I've seen from uh, AI scribe companies, which is which is what they're showing, that uh, it's drastically reducing the, the time required for uh, documentation. Um, but also, I mean, I think over time we will see, uh, we will see other, uh, uh, what should I say, um, uh, other use cases as well, right? So uh, in terms of analyzing data out of the EHR and showing it to the providers in a, in a nice user-friendly manner, or even uh, uh, putting clinical decision support on top of that, so that you know now you have help where it can give you hints that, okay, based on guidelines, this is how the care should be, right? So it doesn't mean that the provider that AI is taking over, but, you know, it's a tool or a supplement. So I think uh, that that's just one other use case of uh, where AI can be truly helpful. Yeah, it sounds like AI is contributing for a more promising future with documentation, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think this is just the beginning of uh, where it's going. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I would agree with that. And I've heard you mention before that well, speaking of AI, that AI should disappear into the workflow. What do you mean by that? Yeah, basically what that means is that uh, it is intuitive enough that mm -hmm. it's doing certain things without you triggering those processes, right? So if right. it's giving me some sort of insight that this patient is at high risk for a certain condition or based on the documentation and the lab data, et cetera, that this patient should be on such and such medication. So if you can get that in your workflow while you are seeing the patient, I think that type of stuff really, you know, where it's not, I mean, it's it's not intrusive. I mean, it, it's, it's giving you a suggestion. It's not forcing you to do anything, right? So that type of uh, stuff, presuming it's done right, right? There's a difference between the signal and the noise, right? So the signal should far, far outweigh the noise, and that's where it will be helpful. On the other hand, if it's a bunch of nonsense where there are some very loose criteria for suggesting something, then it actually ends up not helping you. But hopefully these will be designed in such a fashion where they are, there's a lot more noise uh, signal than noise. Yeah, that makes sense. Shouldn't be disruptive or intrusive or adding yeah. more work. It should exactly. really just be something that will merge into the workflow. And so for health plans or systems evaluating documentation technology today, what's one non-negotiable you think they should demand for any solution, whether it's AI or just um, technology? Yeah, I, I, think, I think it depends, right? So if you're talking about like an AI scribe, I think uh, usability where it works in the background and does a good job of putting everything where it should, right? Now, it may not always capture the intent or, you know, there are nuances in these sort of, these discussions we are having with the patients are very interactive, 
extemporaneous as they say it, right? So it may not always capture the spirit, right? But as long as it's doing a decent job putting things in the right place, you can, I mean, as, as a clinician, we should be going in and editing it and looking at it and editing it anyway, right? So that, that's that's fine. So, uh, so that type of uh, usability thing is important. But when you start talking about... Um, Things like, for example, clinical decision support, I think in that case, the reliability and accuracy would be the most important, right? So, but by far, I think <clears throat> design and usability, generally speaking, would be one, number one. Yeah, definitely. And accuracy is a big one. Exactly. Yeah, I yeah. definitely agree with that one too. Yeah. And well, speaking of technology tools, of course, you work to build technology tools at InfraScience that can be great to improve documentation workflows. So can you tell us a little bit about a reaction you received from a clinician using InfraScience that has uh, stuck with you? And yeah. yeah, that reminded you why you started this. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, as you know, I have a sort of a dual life, right? running in for science, but also seeing patients half of, half of my time. So uh, one day, this was a couple of years ago, I was interviewing a candidate for a nurse practitioner in my office. And uh, as it turned out at the time, she was working at uh, one of our customers uh, about, uh, I don't know, their office was like 40, 50%, 50 miles from where my, my office was. Yeah. So she did not know that I had any involvement in InfraScience. So, so when when she came and I knew where she was working, I said, ah, I, I know that uh, you guys are using some sort of a tool for uh, risk adjustment. And uh, she immediately broke into this big grin. She said, this is fantastic. It's really helped my life. And I can tell you how grateful I am for to the people who have uh, built it. So, and this was just, like I said, she did not know that I had any involvement. That really struck by me that, okay. At least one person is really happy with uh, what we are doing. It's improving the life. So, uh, definitely great to hear that feedback. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so let's close this with a final thought. You often talk about going from burden to benefits. So, what's your message to clinicians who've kind of lost hope that things can get better? Yeah, I, I think things are definitely getting better. I mean, you know, progress is slow a lot of times, but uh, as you probably know, there's been a big push from the government side on interoperability. Yeah. Right. So data is flowing a lot better. I mean, there used to be when we started tremendous amount of, what should I say, obstructions or uh, uh, roadblocks in terms of obtaining data from EHRs and stuff. I think a lot of that has largely disappeared. But from the clinician perspective, what that means is that there are a lot of, uh, the whole ecosystem has a lot of applications and things like that. And obviously there's new technology like AI. But, but what that means is that there are a lot more players who I think have their priorities right, that they want to help clinicians. And therefore, you know, as opposed to having certain incumbents like these big, fat, happy EHR companies who can, you know, couldn't, couldn't care less and because they, 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 they were getting the revenue and they had the customers. So I think we are moving to a much more open marketplace and with this free flow of data and now obviously the influx of technology, I think there's a lot more, in, at least in the newer EHRs and applications that I've seen, there's a, there's a lot more focus on the usability and preventing burnout and things like that. So I think the, there's definitely a better future ahead from uh, documentation and not just documentation, but even clinical decision support uh, help for, uh, for clinicians. Yeah, we can definitely be hopeful with every, uh, all the improvements that we're seeing. Absolutely. Definitely. Well, thank you so much. Uh, that's actually a wrap on today's episode of Care Decoded. Thank you, Sunil, for answering all these questions and bringing both insight and also empathy to this conversation. Um, and to our audience, if this resonated with you, follow the show, share it with our colleague, and let's keep decoding care together. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm.